Jeanne Mons was one of the founders of Montreal, and in 1645, she established one of its first hospitals. In 1929, it was thanks to activist Emily Murphy that Canada's women were officially recognised as people. Later, Dr Roberta Bondar became the first female Canadian astronaut and led an international space medicine research team. But in 1989, there was one man who hated the achievements of women like them. And if he was going to die, he wanted to take as many feminists with him as he could. This episode includes descriptions of violent crimes. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to an episode of Prash's Murder Map. I'm your host Prash and today we're travelling to Montreal in Canada in the province of Quebec. But first we're going to take a quick pit stop over in Australia, home to Cambo, host of the True Crime Island podcast. I've been listening to his show for a while and really enjoy it. He has his own inimitable style covering crimes from all over the world. If you haven't already please consider checking him out Search for True Crime Island wherever you get your podcasts. Let's hear a short promo. Hi, I'm Cambo, the host of True Crime Island podcast and now YouTube channel. Do you get angry when you listen to true crime? Well, so do I. So grab a beer and pull up a deck chair and tune in to True Crime Island and maintain the rage with me as I say what you're thinking. Search for True Crime Island on your favourite audio podcatcher and now with added video goodness on the True Crime Island YouTube channel. Boom fuckalunga. Thanks for listening. So over to Montreal. The city is a fusion of North American modernity and European culture and although many of its inhabitants are bilingual, the majority speak French as their first language. If you drive or walk through the streets of this unique city, you'll soon notice the road signs are written in French, with the English translation printed in smaller letters underneath. Because of its many churches, it has been called the City of a Hundred Steeples, and as well as museums, theatres and festivals, it's home to thriving industries and a huge port. I was lucky enough to visit some relatives there once, and I remember seeing the Olympic Stadium and also thinking how friendly and welcoming the people were, as well as how much the city reminded me of France. Montreal's motto is Concordia Salus, which means well-being through harmony, but on December 6th, 1989, the whole country was shaken to its foundations, when one of the most notorious events in Canadian criminal history showed that one man viewed society as anything but harmonious. Red and white balloons dotted the cafeteria of the Acor Polytechnique, a cheerful sign of the festive season. An observant onlooker passing through the halls might have noticed that the faces of the hard-working students were less tense than usual, breaking into easy laughs and smiles as they anticipated the end of the semester and a well-deserved Christmas break. But there was one man who wasn't smiling. Dressed in a grey windbreaker, blue striped sweater and a baseball cap, with a green garbage bag clutched tightly in his hand, he sat uneasily on a bench near the registrar's office. He looked nervous and edgy, and after 40 minutes, an office employee came out and asked if he needed some help. Without a word, the man picked up his bag and walked away. His eyes were cold and focused, as if he had reached a decision about something. He made his way doggedly to the engineering department. It was just after 5pm and many students had already left, so there were few people around to notice the man as he strode purposefully through the empty corridors. But engineering class C230 was full. He walked in, dropped the green bag on the ground and took out a 223 caliber Ruger Mini 14 semi-automatic hunting rifle. Despite its name, 
the Mini 14 is capable of propelling two inch long cartridges at a speed of more than 3,000 feet per second and the man had come prepared with a hundred rounds of ammunition. Everyone stop everything. Speaking in French, he ordered the men and women to move to separate sides of the room. Taken completely by surprise, nobody had any idea what was happening. Was it an end of semester prank? Back in 1989, Canada had seen very few school shootings, so they could never have anticipated the horrific scene that was about to unfold. The man with the rifle ordered the 60 males in the room to leave, including the professors. I want the woman. You're all a bunch of feminists and I hate feminists. By now, everyone was realizing that this was no prank. The men reluctantly left, leaving nine female students behind. The gunman herded them into a corner and barked. Do you know why you're there? I am fighting feminism. Student Natalie Provost bravely tried to mollify him, assuring him that they were not feminists. Look, we are just women studying engineering, just students trying to lead a normal life. But her words fell on deaf ears. He raised his rifle and relentlessly fired 30 bullets at the young women. The men ran down the corridor to try to warn others, finally understanding that the Acor Polytechnique was in the crosshairs of a mass shooter on a homicidal rampage. The man's name was Mark Lepine. And if he was going to die, he wanted to take as many women with him as possible. Leaving the female engineering students bleeding on the floor without a backward glance, he approached the photocopying centre where he shot and injured two more women and a man. Next, he stormed into another classroom and fired at a female student, but her guardian angel must have been looking out for her that day. The gun jammed and she ran for her life. Lepin holed himself up to check his weapon and a student running past heard him say Shit, I'm out of bullets. By now, someone from engineering class C230, the focus of the first wave of shots, had called the emergency services. But when the first officers arrived on the scene, they made a decision that would be criticised in the aftermath, establishing a perimeter around the building and waiting, only entering much later. While they were stationed outside, debating the best course of action, several more women died. Meanwhile, Lepine had reloaded. He fired a volley of shots into a locked door, but couldn't breach it, so he headed to the foyer, where his eyes narrowed on a female student, stepping off an escalator. He mercilessly shot her, but despite her injuries, she staggered to an emergency staircase and hid on an upper floor. Witnesses later stated that Lapine showed no sign of emotion as he calmly changed his magazine once more and made his way to the financial services office where a member of staff had just locked herself in, whispering desperate prayers that she would be safe. But that day, God wasn't listening. The gunman raised his weapon and shot her dead through the glass. The cafeteria was his next stop. Unaware of the savage drama unfolding in the building, about a hundred people were chatting, eating, and happily making plans with friends for the winter break. Lepine opened fire, and all hell broke loose. The air filled with panicked screams, and students knocked over chairs and tables as they fled. One woman was killed, and another wounded. Next, the gunman reached a storage area, where he found two more female students, and shot them both. A man and a woman hid behind a table, and when the killer's eye fell on them, they held their breath and looked death in the face. Get out! Get out of there! He shouted at them to leave and they escaped unharmed, an uncharacteristic mercy that has never been understood. A woman and two men on the third floor were not so lucky, maimed by a spray of gunfire as Lapine paced the corridor towards room B311. Three students stood on a raised platform, explaining their project to the rest of the class. One of them, Marise Leclerc, was wearing a new red, white and black sweater she had bought for Christmas. Tragically, its colours would soon be mingled with a rusty crimson of blood. The murderer fired. 
barrage of bullets made impact with the students in the front row and some who were trying to make a break for the back door. Marise Leclerc was still alive, but only just. Ignoring her cries for help, Lepine stabbed her three times in the heart with a six-inch hunting knife. He still had ammunition left, but he decided he had sated his desire to kill. He placed the bloody knife, his remaining bullets and his baseball cap onto a desk before sitting down and without hesitation launched a bullet into his own skull. Who was Mark Lepine and what drove him to take a gun and kill 14 women and wound 10 more, as well as four men who simply got in his way? Natalie Provost, who had courageously tried to reason with the gunman, survived four bullet wounds and went on to become a mechanical engineer. On the 20th anniversary of the massacre in 2009, she spoke to the Globe and Mail newspaper and said, That man was first a little baby, a child, a little boy who played ball, who tried to be loved by people all around him. He was all kind of things before he did what he did. The horror was in the act which she committed, which was horrible, unpardonable and abominable. But behind the act was a human being. If one of his victims believes that Lapine's actions were monstrous, but that he was not necessarily a monster, then we too should aim to examine the events objectively and try to understand them. When you look at a picture, he is what you might imagine a quintessential engineering student to look like, completely engrossed in some intricate electronic components or the IT guy at your office who can fix anything. You certainly wouldn't picture him wielding a rifle, the desire to make himself a martyr to an anti-feminist cause overriding any remaining speck of compassion and humanity. Mark Lapine was born on October the 26th, 1964, as Gamil Rodrigue Lias Garbi, to Algerian immigrant Rashid Garbi and Canadian nurse Monique Lapine. Later, Monique would explain that when she first met Rashid, she was impressed by his flashy clothes and confidence, but it wasn't long before the veneer wore off. She underwent three abortions between 1961 and 1963, as having a baby out of wedlock would have brought shame and stigma to a devoutly Catholic family. Rashid paid for the procedures, but was more concerned about his finances than her well-being. He didn't even bother to attend Gamil's birth, choosing to go on a business trip to the Caribbean instead. Rashid was a salesman, and his work took the family from place to place so during Gamil's early life, they lived mostly in South America. He had a bigoted attitude towards women, believing they were inferior and that their duty was to serve men. Already, we begin to see that Lapine's upbringing was moulding him from a young age into the misogynist he later became. Monique worked for her husband as a secretary and Gamil often witnessed his father's violent rages towards her if she made a mistake. But his aggression didn't stop there. He was verbally and physically abusive to Gamil and his younger sister Nadia, who was born in 1967. If their mother tried to console or comfort the children, Rashid would forbid it. He said that was the wrong way to raise them, as it would make them pampered and soft. Well, his parenting style definitely hardened them, but it also hardened Gamil's heart to any love or empathy for others. As a young child, his cries went unanswered until he eventually fell silent and on one occasion, Rashid insisted on Monique going to the cinema with him, leaving their son alone in the house without a babysitter at just 18 months old. When they returned home, they found him crying in the middle of the bedroom floor, having climbed out of his crib, probably feeling absolute desperation and abandonment at being left alone for so long. When Nadia was born, it was clear that Gamil's understanding of family and love had not developed as it should have done. He was extremely jealous of the new arrival, and once his mother found him violently shaking her cradle from side to side, as if he were trying to knock it to the floor, Monique later described him as a very possessive child, saying, He always wanted to be close to me, to the point of getting angry when I was upset. 
even for a short time, and sulking when I looked after his little sister. This isn't surprising when his early years were marked by isolation, abandonment, and crying out for help and love, but thanks to his father never receiving it. One day in 1970, Gamil woke his parents in the early hours of the morning by singing loudly. Rashid was furious and struck his six-year-old son across the face so viciously that the bruising was still visible a week later. After this, Monique decided it was time to leave, but it was too late to undo the psychological damage her husband had unleashed on the family. It wasn't just the little boy's innocent singing that was brutally crushed that day, it was also the little boy's heart. Bitter about the divorce, Rashid shirked his responsibilities and refused to pay any child support, so Monique returned to nursing to provide for her children. She excelled in her career and moved them to Montreal with her, where she was appointed as Director of Nursing at the Royal Victoria Hospital. As she worked full-time to provide for Gamil and Nadia, she had no choice but to pay retired nurses or other local families to take care of them during the week. They returned to Monique at weekends, when she would try her best to give them a regular family life with board games and home-cooked meals. When a caregiver or family moved away or had a change in circumstances, Monique would be forced to find someone else to look after her son and daughter, which wasn't ideal for their stability. This might not have been a problem for well-adjusted children who had enjoyed a loving family life up to then, but due to their traumatic early years with violent Rashid at the head of the household, this arrangement probably just worsened their dysfunctional development. There was an occasion when improvement work was being done on the Montreal apartment, and Monique couldn't find Gamil. She frantically searched everywhere, feeling a wave of relief when she finally found him curled up in a cupboard. When asked why he was hiding, he said he was scared that the workman would hit him. Once a week, Gamil and Nadia were taken to see their father under supervision from a social worker. If we didn't already have enough evidence of how much Rashid terrified his son, one day Gamil decided he'd had enough of these visits and grabbed the steering wheel as his mother was driving, trying to steer them off the road. Thankfully, nobody was hurt, and after this, Gamil didn't see his dad again. How could a man frighten his son so much that he would risk his own life and those of his mother and sister to avoid seeing him. I think this hammers home just how much of an effect bad parenting can have. People call Lepin a monster, but at that time of his life, the only monster I see is Rashid Garbi. More incidents began to occur that made it obvious Gamil was not like other children. One of the caregiver families told his mother they'd had to watch him very closely and related a tale about when they'd taken him on a camping trip. They asked Gamil to help fetch a propane tank from the car, and when he came back with it, he suddenly hurled it into the campfire, where it immediately exploded. Nobody was hurt, but the surrogate family was disturbed by their reckless behaviour. By 1976, Monique's financial situation had improved, as she had secured a prestigious position as Director of Nursing, so the children moved back in with her permanently. But when she was at work, it was up to Gamil to look after his sister. The pair didn't get on, and one evening he was so angry with her that he dug a hole in the garden and created a fake tombstone to place there with a photograph of his sister attached. He then stared blankly at his work through the kitchen window, eyes glazed over. When Monique returned home, she was horrified and made him take it down. A few months later, the family cat disappeared. Nadia claimed she'd seen Gamil putting a rope around its neck, but he denied it. The pet was never seen again. His mother sought help for both children from St Justine's Hospital, and although they received some counselling, the psychiatrist felt there was nothing fundamentally wrong with shy and withdrawn Gamil. But they did recommend therapy for the more outwardly rebellious Nadia, who had started drinking and taking drugs with a group of unsuitable friends. She was sent to a boarding school for troubled teenagers, and her brother must have been relieved by her absence. Not only had he been bullied by his father, but his sister 
had also continually taunted and insulted him. She had once told one of her friends that the best way to make Gamil angry was to call him ugly and stupid, laughing as every acidic word eroded her brother's already delicate self-esteem. Despite his odd behaviour, he was helpful to his mother, mowing the lawn, shoveling snow and fixing things around the house, but he harboured a lot of anger and hate towards his father. On his first day at Pierre Fons High School, he refused to answer to the name Gamil Garby and shortly afterwards changed it to Mark Lapine, taking his mother's maiden name as he didn't want to associate himself with his father. It's also possible he'd been picked on in the past for having an Arabic name and no longer wanted to bear any sign of Garby's Algerian background. Monique continued trying her best for her son and wanting him to have a positive male role model. She signed him up to a Canadian mentoring program which still exists today called Big Brothers, Big Sisters. This was an enriching experience for Mark and for a couple of years he enjoyed photography and motocross with his new friend. But the meetings were halted in 1979 when his mentor was arrested on suspicion of molesting children. As a teenager, Mark achieved average grades, and he did have a good friend, John Belanger, who he met on the school bus. His uncle sometimes took Mark out hunting, and it was probably during these trips that he first learnt how to use a gun. He was ardently enthusiastic about war games and paintballing, and liked to shoot pigeons with an air rifle. He became interested in building electronic gadgets, often watched horror and action films, and was fascinated by the military. He applied to the Canadian Armed Forces, but was declined as they were concerned about antisocial behavioural traits they identified in his personality. Mark had a part-time job in the kitchens of St Jude's Hospital, washing dishes and serving meals to patients. His colleagues described him as weird and an attention seeker, who always started arguments. He had been known to slam meal carts down and spill food, which could have been a sign of anxiety and distraction, or barely suppressed anger. His co-workers made fun of his acne, and it was around this time that Mark grew a beard to hide his pockmarked face. He did have one friend there, 19-year-old Dominique Leclerc, daughter of one of the hospital managers. She said that his co-workers were mean and always avoided him, but she tried to be kind, noticing that he was nervous, shy and hyperactive. He confided in her that he'd asked lots of girls out, but they always refused, and he thought the reason was because he wasn't good-looking. By sad chance, the final victim of Mark's massacre just a few years later would turn out to be Dominique's cousin, Maryse. He wasn't a complete loner, as he did have some friends, and even moved into an apartment in Lavelle with Eric Cazette, who he had known from Pierre Fons High School. Eric described Mark as having a bad temper and a habit of flying into a rage at the smallest things, punching a hole in a wall in one incident because he'd burnt some meat. He also had a disquieting interest in gun magazines, but Eric cited his positive qualities too, including a hunger to learn, an eagerness to help friends, and in lighter moments, an enjoyment of cartoons. In 1987, Mark was fired from his job at the hospital. He was furious, and was heard to say that he intended to go on a killing rampage, which would end in his own death. He claimed that the reason he'd been fired by his female manager was so his job could be taken by another woman. The unemployed 23-year-old bought a computer with his savings, and spent the winter closeted away in his apartment, teaching himself how to use it. By the year of the massacre, Lepine had started various college courses, including pure science, electronic technology and programming, but dropped out of all of them, despite achieving good grades when he put the effort in. At Control Data, a private post-secondary school, where he was studying programming, he had really shone. His marks were always in the top 15%, and teachers remember him as a quiet, hard-working young man. Is it possible he feared finishing anything, because his low self-belief and esteem prevented him from imagining a possible future where he could be successful. 
A fellow student believed that with his abilities in electronics and programming, Mark was a potential IT genius and should have had high hopes and aspirations. He found it difficult to talk to women and when he was partnered with Sylvie Druan in the lab at Control Data, he was dismissive and rude, expecting her to do any washing or fetching required for experiments. But as time went on, the pair became more friendly and when she found out he was a computer expert, she asked if he would help her as she was taking her in the night course in the subject. He readily agreed, but it soon became apparent that it wasn't for her benefit, but his own, so he could show off his 3D modelling techniques and enjoy the sound of his own voice. When interviewed after the massacre, Sylvie said he didn't teach, he just solved the problems himself and handed them back to her. He needed to feel important to others and could be controlling and patronising, he was good at theory in the lab, but not the practical side, and he made nervous mistakes when his mind wandered, but he still achieved an A+. Lapine suffered from tunnel vision in his view of the world. Another lab partner, André Tremblay, recalled him bringing a newspaper to class featuring a story about a female police officer who had saved an old man from a house fire. He had started to grandstand. Women are not physically suited to law enforcement work. There are only six women in the whole Montreal police force. André was surprised and asked him how he knew that. Mark replied, To date, I have only found the name of six of them in newspaper stories. It seems strange that someone with such a strong scientific and engineering mindset would make an assumption like this based on incomplete evidence. By this bizarre argument, if he counted all the men's names in newspaper articles, that must be the total of all the male officers in Montreal. This shows he wasn't grounded in reality, or maybe he was guilty of confirmation bias, only looking for evidence that fitted his own warped beliefs. This wasn't the only odd thing that Lapine's lab partner noticed. André saw that he was becoming increasingly withdrawn and his eyes were always red, as if he wasn't sleeping. Some of his classmates tried to encourage Mark to socialise, inviting him to restaurants and bars, but he refused, preferring to stay at home watching violent movies on video. He had been heard to make jokes about women and had once scribbled the words women drive as a criminal on a poster about drink driving. Since moving out of the family home, his relationship with his mother was distant, and when a friend asked him hypothetically how he would feel if his mother died, he said, I would be like a stone, I would not react. The last time Sylvie Drouin saw him in the lab before he left, she went away with the strange feeling that she would never see him again. She told him she might call him over the summer, but never did, choosing not to continue their tentative friendship. She remembered him seeing hurried, as if he had something important on his mind, something that nobody else could know about. Her perception would prove to be eerily prophetic. Mark's dream had been to study engineering at the École Polytechnique, but they rejected him, probably because he hadn't completed any of the courses he'd started. Being unable to commit to anything for the long term is a common trait of killers, and when we examine their histories, we often see them dropping out or being unable to hold down jobs. On November 21st, 1989, Mark Lapine obtained a firearms license and bought a Sturm Ruger Mini 14 semi-automatic rifle, along with a banana clip which could hold 30 cartridges and 100 Remington 223 caliber bullets. The total price was $765, but the real cost would turn out to be 14 lives lost and countless more ruined. Many survivors suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, and in August 1990, former student Sato Blay hanged himself. He left a suicide note, explaining that he couldn't live with the fact that he'd been there, but had done nothing to stop the shooting. Tragically, his parents also killed themselves within a year of their son's death. The repercussions of Lapine's actions sent ripples of horror, fear and shock 
to touch more people's lives than anyone realised. The mortician who examined the bodies had seen inconceivable violence and cruelty throughout his career, but after the Ecole Polytechnic shooting, he left his job and never worked at the morgue again. Chief Investigator Andre Tessier had spoken about how he still bears emotional scars, the psychological wounds deepened by the discovery that his friend's daughter was one of the victims. Many more were no doubt tormented by the memories of the event and survivors' guilt, replaying it over and over in their minds, wondering if there was something more they could have done. Male survivors of the massacre were criticised, with people questioning why didn't they try to intervene. But none of the students went to the Acor Polytechnique that day, expecting to be hurled into the midst of a bloody drama, and at that time, particularly in Canada, school shootings were uncommon. They may not have realised the gravity of what was happening in front of them, as it took several minutes to shake off the idea that it was just an end-of-semester joke in bad taste. Survivor Natalie Provo spoke out and said she felt nothing could have been done to prevent the tragedy, and that there was no reason for her fellow students to feel guilty. As the shockwaves heightened through the Montreal community, the question on everyone's lips was, why did he do it? Part of the answer was found in the suicide note in his pocket. Here are some extracts. Please note that if I committed suicide today, it is not for economic reason. For I have waited until I exhausted all my financial means, even refusing jobs, but for political reasons. Because I have decided to send the feminists, who have always ruined my life, to their maker. For seven years, life has brought me no joy. I have decided to put an end to those viragos. I tried in my youth to enter the force as an officer cadet, which would have allowed me to possibly get into the arsenal. They refused me. I, therefore, had to wait until this day to execute my plan. In between, I continued my studies in a haphazard way, for they never really interested me, knowing in advance my fate. Even if the mad killer epithet will be attributed to me by the media, I consider myself as a rational erudite that only the arrival of the Grim Reaper has forced to take extreme acts. The feminists have always enraged me. They want to keep the advantages of women, for example cheaper insurances, extended maternity leave, etc., while seizing for themselves those of men. Thus, it is an obvious truth that if the Olympic Games removed the men-woman distinction, there would be a woman only in the graceful events. So, the feminists are not fighting to remove that barrier. They are so opportunistic they do not neglect to profit from the knowledge accumulated by men through the ages. They always try to misrepresent them every time they can. Thus, the other day, I heard they were honoring the Canadian men and women who fought at the front line during the world wars. How can you explain that since women were not authorized to go to the front line? Sorry for this too brief letter, Mark Lepin. At the end of the note was a hit list of 19 high profile women he wanted to see dead, including the head of a broadcasting corporation. Some of the assertions in his letter are factually incorrect. In World War II, more than 50,000 Canadian women served in the armed forces in uniform, in the Canadian Women's Army Corps, the Women's Division of the Royal Canadian Air Force and the Naval Service, and many more risked their lives as mechanics, wireless operators, photographers and nurses. Yes, nursing was a frontline profession, and the ships they travelled on ran the risk of being torpedoed, which the SS Caribou fell victim to in 1942. As for his claim that women benefit from the knowledge accumulated by men through the ages, he's wrong again there too. Many women have made huge contributions to science, medicine and technology, and the reason we haven't always heard of them is because of people like Lapine and his father and their misogynist views. Had he done his homework, rather than believing everything the chauvinist Rashid told him, he would have known that his modern day computer programming knowledge was only made possible because of Ada Lovelace, one of the first programmers in the world. If you're interested in this subject, 
I highly recommend the book Wonder Women, 25 innovators, inventors and trailblazers who changed history by Sam Max, with the audiobook version narrated by Canadian actress Jodel Ferland. So why did Mark hold such anachronistic beliefs? Again, his father Rashid Garbi must be held partly responsible. We don't know anything about Garbi's upbringing, but it seems likely that he was raised by strict Algerian parents in an Islamic culture, although he was no longer a practicing Muslim as an adult. It's possible that his own father was verbally or physically abusive and reinforced traditional stereotypes of male and female roles. This then became a learnt behaviour that he carried with him and continued in his own household with Monique and the children, a vicious cycle that should have been broken. It would be fascinating to hear from Garby now and hear what he has to say about how his small-mindedness and violent parenting worked out for everyone, but the CBC's attempt to track him down using a private investigator were unsuccessful. The psychologist Freud suggested that a child's development is mostly determined by events in early childhood. Modern psychology has shown some of his ideas to be outdated, but most counsellors believe that childhood experiences do play a significant part in shaping a person's life. I'm not a psychologist, but previous jobs have taken me to various mental health facilities and prisons, and I know several counsellors and therapists, all of whom would agree. One of the first things any counsellor asks a new client to do is to talk about their childhood, because that's where many clues can be found to help understand someone's behaviour and belief system. Now just to be clear, we're not looking for excuses, but for explanations. A healthy family life will teach children constructive ways of dealing with problems, like talking, writing a letter, or working with someone to compromise and agree on an issue. But Lapine grew up in a home where the only reaction to problems was anger. Rashid responded to everything by lashing out with abuse, so is it surprising that his son learnt to mimic that behaviour? Mark's interactions with his mother and sister would also have influenced his views about women as Nadia tried to humiliate him at every opportunity and his mother had never been allowed to comfort him when he was upset and had been largely absent from his life while she was at work, which was no fault of her own as her ex-husband's refusal to pay child support meant she had no choice but to work full time. Lapine had misconceptions about society and maybe he felt he'd been treated unfairly because the Acol Polytechnique had rejected his application. Perhaps he thought a female student had been given the place he believed was rightly his, just as he fantasised that the reason for losing his job at the hospital was so a woman could take over his role. A university admissions officer he met with in April 1989 stated that Lapine had complained to him about how women were taking over the job market from men. Unfortunately, his experiences in life never helped to turn him onto a better path and led to him being increasingly isolated. He was treated as a social outcast by his work colleagues and his upbringing hadn't equipped him with the skills to handle this rejection. His mother Monique eventually spoke to the press years after the shooting and explained that to her son there were no shades of grey and things were either good or bad. He could never be cheerful if he felt down and even if one person called him a loser he believed he would never succeed. Because he couldn't love himself, he became convinced no one could ever love him and he tried desperately to make the world see his importance, hiding his sensitivity and low self-esteem behind a facade of violence and sexism. Along with his suicide letter, Lapine had written to two of his friends. In one letter, he asked them to give his fridge to his landlord to compensate for his missing rent and left all his other possessions to school friend John Belanger. Another friend received a cryptic note, hinting that the motive for the rampage was hidden somewhere in Mark's apartment at 2175 Bordeaux. This friend was tracked by journalists as he claimed his legacy. A collection of science fiction books, articles on the Second World War, videotapes of violent films, a plastic skull, and even more oddly, a piece of paper stuck between the floorboards which read, The other is the solution. If you have found this, you are already in the know. 
The note guided his friend to look for a book on the shelf by an author mentioned in the earlier letter, which turned out to be the biography of American pilot Chuck Yeager, who was the first person to break the sound barrier in 1947. Inside its pages, the macabre treasure hunt continued. The next message read, If you have found this letter, you are on the right track. It contains my last wishes. At the back of the room is a suitcase with a few things that I would like to pass on. Mark's friend took a deep breath as he unzipped the suitcase, wondering what horrific mementos might lurk inside. But all he found was a collection of hardware and computer games, a real anticlimax. Mark had also left a message for his mother in his final days, a handwritten note simply saying, I'm sorry, Mum, this is inevitable. A police psychiatrist who studied the case suggested that Lapine suffered from a serious personality disorder and had extreme narcissistic vulnerability, demonstrated by fantasies of power and success, combined with high levels of self-criticism and an inability to deal with rejection and failure. He compensated for his feelings of powerlessness and incompetence with a violent and a grandiose imaginary life. His mother suggested her son had seen her as a feminist and that he wanted to indirectly take revenge on her for neglecting him while she pursued her career and also speculated that he suffered from attachment disorder due to childhood abuse and abandonment. In a thought-provoking coincidence, I discussed attachment disorder in my last episode on the Frankston killer Paul Denyer, which makes me wonder if this is common among aggressive people. Mark's sister Nadia started a philosophy course after the tragedy, but she struggled to cope with the media attention and her mental health went into a downward spiral. She became addicted to heroin and cocaine, dying of an overdose in 1996, aged 28. Monique went on to write a book called Aftermath about the loss of her two children and a recurring nightmare that her son was coming to kill her. All this damage, all this loss of life, stems back to one man, Rashid Garbi. Yes, Mark was the one with his finger on the trigger, and he had a personal responsibility for what he did. But if his father had not been a violent misogynist, who abused his son mentally and physically, and was so instrumental in shaping Mark's view about women, would the tragedy have happened? Or would Mark have had better support in his early life, equipping him to handle any hard times that came his way, like losing his job, or having an application rejected, constructively, not with hostility. A former friend of his sister, Isabel LaHaye, said, Mark Lapine was not a monster. It's shocking and sad that a promising young man found it in himself to cold-bloodedly shoot and kill 14 women. Maybe as he pulled the trigger, he was thinking of one of Chuck Yeager's famous quotes. You don't concentrate on risk, you concentrate on results. No risk is too great to prevent the necessary job from getting done. He truly believed that punishing feminists was his mission. And when he entered the Acor Polytechnique that day, his victims could see it in his eyes, that he was hell-bent on revenge and driven by his objective. As a result of the mishandling of the scene by the first police responders, changes to emergency response protocols were made and have since proven to be effective with better coordination and prompt intervention to minimise loss of life. As for Lapine's efforts to crush feminism, well, they've backfired, because December the 6th each year is now a National Day of Remembrance and Action in Canada against violence towards women. Female enrolment in engineering courses increased by 20% between 1988 and 1989, and the massacre led to questions about how he bought such a dangerous weapon so easily. Heidi Rafgen, an engineering student, and Therese Davio, whose daughter, Genevieve, was killed that day, became staunch advocates of gun control after their experiences, and the Coalition for Gun Control was created soon after the event. Their efforts may finally be paying off. In a recent announcement on 29th of April 2020, it was confirmed that Ottawa will introduce a ban on assault-style firearms, including the Ruger Mini-14, used in the Acor Polytechnique killings. A funeral for the victims was held at Montreal's Notre Dame Basilica and tens of thousands of Canadians paid their respects. 
Each year, a concert is held at a nearby park, and a memorial has been built to commemorate the lives that were lost. These are their names. Genevieve Bergeron Hélène Colgon Natalie Crotor Barbara Denio Anne-Marie Edouard Maud Haviernik Marise Lajanier Marise Leclerc Anne-Marie Lemay Sonia Pelletier Michel Richard Annie Saint Arnaud Annie Turcotte Barbara Klutchnik Vidajevic Nowadays, we're all much more aware of the risk of school and workplace shootings, but it's sad that we need to be. Whether you go to a workplace or study at a school or college, you can help by noticing others. If you see someone who is a loner or expresses ideas that just don't seem right, please do something. Lapine's classmates tried and maybe nothing would have changed the outcome. But we can all be more inclusive and never alienate people for being different or because of their appearance. You never know what a difference that could make. And if it comes to it, flag up your concerns to someone qualified because speaking out could save lives. The killer we discussed today grew up in an abusive household and everyone should know that's never okay. I'm recording this in early May 2020 when many countries are still in lockdown and there's been a massive reported increase in calls to domestic violence helplines while people are stuck indoors together. If this has affected you or someone you know, please consider calling the domestic violence helpline for your area and remember that men can be victims too. You've been listening to Prasha's Murder Map. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love for you to subscribe, rate and leave a review. You can also visit my website, prashasmurdermap.com, find me on Twitter and YouTube, or simply do things the old-fashioned way by dropping an email to prashasmurdermap at gmail.com with any comments or suggestions. In the next episode, travel back in time with me to Victorian England, where we'll discover the morbid origin of the phrase Sweet Fanny Adams. So until then, take care everyone!